Google Translate thinks this page is in Tagalog, so up there. So if you can't understand me, I'm sorry about that. Um, I, I don't have a lot of slides. Uh, I'm going to do some demos, but I'm told that everything here is being recorded in video and audio, so you can review that later. And I also have all the materials on uh, public uh, repositories, which I'll get into later. So I'm uh, Peter Eisentraut. I'm Postgres contributor. I currently work at Meet.me, which is a social networking platform. I live and work in Pennsylvania. And you can reach me in the, on the internet at these places and others if you search for me. Uh, so when I, uh, for reasons that will become obvious in a moment, when I sort of started uh, working on this uh, problem space, which I'll get to in a moment, I, I thought of this uh, as beyond query logging. But uh, last year there was already a talk, uh, not in this conference, but in another conference, there was already a talk called Beyond Query Logging. And uh, so in, in, in some sense, this is sort of the, the next generation after that, perhaps. So I, I well, my thing here says I'm a senior data architect, but in, in, in practice, for the most, most of my time, I'm a DBA. And uh, we are, as I mentioned, a social network or social networking platform, depending on how you want to uh, put it. So we have, you know, regular infra uh, web, web infrastructure uh, backed by Postgres databases, which are, there's a question there. Can you uh, raise your volume? Sorry, what? Volume? I'm, I'm not in control of that, but I can have someone help me here. Ah. So, uh, <laughs> So, you know, we have a website open to the internet. We do, you know, deployments multiple times a day. So the whole thing is in, in constant motion. And we are the DBAs. We have to keep the, 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 the bottom of the tier running. And, you know, we have monitoring set up, and every so often something, some alarm triggers, and it would be fun if it triggers right now, but it doesn't, so. Um, and in, in my mind, or in, in the mind of our team, there are two kinds of alerts that we're interested. One is sort of the, what I think of maybe the hardware level alerts when the, the box has died or the, the file system has gone read only or the disk uh, has disappeared and things like that. And uh, now I can hear myself. And now, and uh, in those cases, we pass this off to, off to the sysops team and they you know, either have to repair the box or, or, or repair the disk or things like that. So we don't really, we're not really concerned about that. We have the normal standby infrastructure, so we do a failover if, we, if needed and, and things go on. The more interesting and, and more uh, problematic uh, alerts are when certain metrics change. And, and the metrics that we're interested in, for example, is well, things like connection count, transactions per second, errors per second, uh, CPU load, uh, IO wait times, those sort of things. And, and, and those can change for all kinds of reasons, that the, that the website is getting hammered, that new, new things were deployed that you know, maybe don't work as they should, and, and things like that. And then we need to go in and, and, and find out uh, what happened there. And th that's what this is about. So one, one thing we actually have I want to show you is uh, in case uh, code was deployed that didn't work out well, we have this, what we call the developer attitude readjustment tool called the uh, short for Dart, which is this thing here. So that's our, that's our Dart. So if, if you're a developer and, and, and your code sucked, that, that's what you get. So now let's 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 take as an example, which is easy to understand. Let's say you are uh, your monitoring tells you that the error errors per second count went up, and, and now we, you want to know why. So the you know straightforward way to do this is you go into your log files and you you know grab around perhaps. And after a while of grappling, you think, you know, it wouldn't be nice if we could put this into a more structured form and 
you know, then we can use a real query language on this. So in many, uh, many years ago, the uh, CSV log format was uh, created for that purpose ostensibly. And, and you know, that's, that's a reasonable idea, but for various reasons that doesn't really work for us. One is that just the time to take the log files and load them somewhere else and analyze them is, it, that takes too long. And we, we, have this, we had this infrastructure set up for that, but it just, it didn't, uh, it wasn't fast enough. So, you know, if you want to know, okay, error count went up, I have to fix this within, within a few minutes. I, I can't wait, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes for all this stuff to be copied over and, and, and loaded and indexed and all that stuff. The, the other problem with, the, with that is that uh, if you have ongoing events, you want to you wanna track them as they go on. So if you take the log file and copy it over and take a look and see what happens, then wh what do you do with the data that came in in, in those a couple of minutes? Then you need, to, you need to take the, you know, save, you need to uh, mark where you left off and then take the next chunk of the log file and, and do all kinds of stuff. And, and that, that's very complicated. I know some people do that, but it, it's you know, not nice. And just as a side note, if your server is, is getting hammered, don't rotate the log files. That takes your server down. We've, we've tried that once and, and we didn't try it again. So there are you know, other uh, solutions in, in this space that you, you probably heard of like something like PG Bash or PG Fuin, PG Stat Statements, those are all it, tools that are related to that, but you know, think they don't really solve this problem of like what what was the count what was the what was the query that threw the most errors in the next, in the last five minutes? What was the query that how did that query behave yesterday at the same time? And and things like that. So that that didn't really help us either. So L looking around, uh, we came across a, a overlooked feature in 9 point, uh, Postgres 9.2, which is the logging hooks. Um, like, so logging hooks are available in Postgres 9.2, so you can use them today. All, all of this stuff I'm describing here is what we, we're using in, in the real world. Uh, like all hooks in Postgres, they're not documented. So that's why they get overlooked. Um, but if you, uh, I have here the, I have all this in the material later, but just to show you the, uh, the commit that, make it bigger. So this, this was committed 9.2 by, uh, and the, uh, the, uh, uh, or, or the feature came from uh, this fellow, Martin Pichlak, who mentioned down here, who works for Skype. And he's, he's, the, he's the guy who actually uh, wrote the SQL Met stuff that I got blamed for four years ago. So I have sort of a, I'm always latching onto his features, I suppose. So, and uh, w what it does is, is pretty simple. If you look at the diff, uh, there's a huge comment here, which is actually the documentation. And actually, just all it does is introduces a new variable here. Emit log hook, no, emit log hook. All right, it's a pointer variable which you can assign to a function. And that function gets called every time a log message is written to the, the text file that you would otherwise have. And so if you, if you, you know, load a module using the normal mechanisms, you can execute any code you want at that point. And so now you have endless possibilities, right? So go, going back to the use case, what, what I, I want to do is take the, the log data and throw it into a structured storage, for example, a database. So basically what I want to do is some, something like that, right? So I have my production database here. I use this hook and then some extra code, which I'll get to, and then you can throw it in the other database and then you can do your analysis there. And all of this is in you know, quasi real time, right? Not actual real time, but uh, as it happens, as a stream. 
So you could now write your own hook for that, and it's not very hard if you know C. But I think everyone who knows C is in the other talk about hacking Postgres. So the idea here is you use existing components to, to do the work. And Martin Pichlag also wrote a, well, I guess what you can consider the reference implementation for a logging hook, which is this uh, tool called pglogforward, which you can search for. And I'll have the URL in the notes, but you can just search for that and you'll find it on GitHub. Now, the, as far as I understand, Skype's motivation behind this whole feature is not necessarily what I'm describing here, but they were concerned about that just the plain logging the log volume takes their uh, servers down or you know, has too much uh, load on the server, so they wanted just to have a way to get the, the log data off quickly. But you know, it lends itself to other uh, uses as well. So, and now I'll, I'll, I'd like to show you how, how that works. So, So here, here's, here's the um, GitHub repository for that. So you don't have to write the link down, but I'll, I'll have it later. And actually, in, in the uh, patches subdirectory, there's, there's the actual logging hook patch is in there. So you can actually back patch that all the way to 8.4. And, and, uh, I, I have also done that, so that's that's very simple. As you saw, the patch is not big, so it, you know if you, if you want to use this in older versions and you can just and you want to roll your own, you can just install that patch. Then you can use the same feature there. Other than that, it's just one simple C file, and you you build it like a normal PGXS uh, module, which gets me to the demo. So I have this, all, all of the stuff I'm showing now is I have that on, on my GitHub, so you can play with that later also if you want. Um, is that reasonably big? Yeah, looks pretty okay. So the, fir the first thing you want to do is you build it, right? And then you get this, always this error, which you've probably seen a lot in, if you want to build extension modules, which is really annoying me. So you need to do, this thing here, right? All right, so that builds. Install, so that was easy. Now, this is Ubuntu here, so you know the paths are always a little bit different. So there it is. It's, it's, well, you can't see, it's the green one because it's executable and the other ones are not. That's another platform difference, but it doesn't matter. Now, the, the, way, you, the way you configure this is, as follows. So this is a Postgres configuration file with a bunch of stuff in it. And then at the end, you add these uh, statements there. So there are two ways to load this. One, one is using shared preload libraries, and one is using local preload libraries. And the difference for those who don't know is shared preload libraries get loaded into the Postmaster at the time you start the instance. And local preload libraries is loaded at the time you start a session. And I just you know, threw PGSAT statements here as an example. For, but I, I recommend putting it into local preload libraries for the reason that, A, you don't have to restart your server to even install this. And two, it, you know, keeps, all the, it keeps the stuff out of the postmaster, which you want to ha have stable. But you, but you don't have to do it that way. You can also put it into shared preload libraries. In order, to, in order to load stuff from shared preload libraries, you have to do the following. And you, you need to make a directory called plugins here, and then move that thing in there. And, and that, that's totally bizarre, and I am planning to get rid of that. And those who follow all the patches I sent to hackers, I, that's the reason why I introduced this feature, at, which didn't go, get into 9.3 to have sort of a, a white list of things you can put into local shared, uh, local preload libraries. So in, in the future, I hope to have a better solution than that. And 
So now, that, that's the installation, right? So if you, you need to do this, put it into the plugins directory. If you want to load it through local uh, preload libraries, otherwise you just leave it where it was. And now you take this configuration file that I just showed as, a, as an example. And uh, put it into place. Reload, so you don't need to restart. It's nice. So while, while this loads, and I have a background job here which creates some log, logging, so, so we'll see something in a moment. Let's get back to that uh, file here. So one, once you have loaded it one way or the other, you have this log forward namespace of new configuration parameters. Yes. And uh, all right, nope, 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 nope. All right, this doesn't work so fun. Sorry. All right, has to be like that. Um, and you can create multiple desti destinations, but this is just a, a simple case of you have one destination, you use the target names variable, uh, variable here, which you just invent a random name here. This doesn't mean anything. And then based on that name, you have additional parameters that get kind of created on the fly once it reads this here. And then you give it the destination of uh, where it, this is supposed to go. And what uh, PG Log Forward does, it, it sends the log data as UDP packets to the destinations that you give here in the formats that you give here. And it supports JSON, syslog, and netstring. And so syslog you know, so if you just like you keep using syslog, you can use that. But I guess JSON is the most interesting because it already gives you the log data in a structured form. And, and you know, the, the a, the, this is the destination of where you have the agent who receives that. And then you need to invent a port number. So once, once you have that running, you can, you know, you can use Netcat to kind of test this. Well, PG log format only supports JSON, syslog, and netstring. But, you know, it, it's not hard to add more formats. And that's, you should also you know, consider this as a toolkit to some degree. I think the JSON format is just fine, but if you want to have something different, you just need to basically assemble that as, as a string and ship it out over UDP. So, so here's, you know, here's the UDP packet that is being sent around. So that's all, all the typical logging fields that, that you, you know, are familiar with in uh, JSON format. And uh, now you can imagine what you want to do with that. You just write your own little thing and process that, un unbundle the JSON, and then you have the logging format, all the logging data, and, and can do whatever you want with that. So, in the uh, so you probably need to do some programming now. So in the PG log forward repository, there's also a, in the testing directory, it's actually sort of an example implementation in uh, Python, which kind of gives you a start if you want. So, you know, it's not long, two pages here, and it actually handles JSON, NetString, and syslog, so this is even longer than you really need, need it to be. And uh, so this, you can also use to test it if you don't like Netcat. And it prints out the stuff. And then you can actually use that as a template and just insert your own code there. So in, in order to, uh, let, me, let me just show you how you would do multiple um, destinations. So here's a different configuration file which contains the stuff I just, uh, I just showed, but adds a second destination here. So this is the stuff we already saw. And here I just invented the new target name, which uses a you know, slightly different destination, uses syslog format, uses a different port. And there's also additional, a small number of additional arguments where you can pre-filter the stuff that gets processed by this. So 
this is not very user friendly. Uh, something perhaps to address is that you can give the minimum error level as an integer, which is the internal encoding of what is a, you know, debug info warning error. So that, that, that's kind of, uh, you know, it's not really good, but you can do it and you can probably easily change that. So this would be, you know, this would be, you can then write your second agent, which just gets the errors in syslog format, and then you can hook that into maybe an, an alerting system or a, a system that counts the errors or things like that. So if, I guess it's partially obvious the reason UDP is used here is that you don't want the, this whole additional processing to hold up your actual session, right? So it, I have experimented with other logging hooks that, for example, using uh, AMQP to put this information in the queue, but then if your broker is, is down, has problems, then every, you know, the, the queue blocks everything. So UDP in that sense is, is useful, but of course this, doesn't, this is not going to be an auditing system because it can lose packets on a load, right? So now the, get, getting back to the original goal is putting that into a, a database is then uh, not difficult from here. So create a new, you know, you can put it into the same cluster if you want, but then you have kind of a looping problem if you don't configure this correctly. And then, <laughs> And in practice, you probably want to have this on a different host, right? So I'll make a, a separate cluster here. And make a database. Make a very small demo schema. Again, all this data is, is online. You can try this out yourself. So now I just created very, yeah, I'll show the table in a moment. And I wrote, I you know, essentially took the demo Python code that I just showed and put some database stuff in there. So it, instead of just printing it out, it takes the some of the log data, I didn't put everything in here right now, but you know, some of the log data just puts in the table, so that's pretty easy. You know, this is literally one page of code here almost. So let's start that. Just running this as Postgres now, so I don't have to set up authentication, all that kind of stuff now. So and with any kind of luck, We have logging data in the table. And this is essentially a very simple of what I'm actually using in practice. Now, if you look at that, there's, you know, you, you can imagine all kinds of things that you can improve here. So first of all, you want to change the, the E level thing to something you can read. But for example, here are durations are being logged here, here. And for example, one thing I do in the actual code is I you know, run this through a regular expression and split it up into two columns. So I have the duration in a separate column from the, um, the statement, and then I can run you know, analysis on the query durations. And, and that's super useful. Or if you're know, interested in, in something very specific, if you're specifically interested in you know, disconnections or connections, you can take this and split it up and mangle it any way you want. Right? So, that's essentially you know, the solution to my original problem. Now, of, of course, you also want to partition this table, maybe normalize it to split out the actual strings, which are obviously going to be repeated into a, a separate table. So you manage the storage that way. And um, the way the way I, I run this, I start these this agent and, and supervisor D, and uh, 
That way you can also spin up multiple instances quite easily because this thing is not going to be very uh, you know, concurrent or it's not concurrent because Python doesn't support that very easily. So you, sp you can spin up a bunch of different instances, give them different port numbers and point different places, uh, different uh, production servers to different ports and uh, achieve concurrency that, there. It's, it's not very pretty, but it seems to work just fine. So that's what I'm doing. One thing I'm actually playing with it in the, in, in the terms of concurrency is, is I re-implemented that uh, agent I just showed in, in Go, the programming language, which has better concurrency support. And uh, I would put that in GitHub, so if someone wants to experiment with Go, perhaps uh, you can uh, look at that. And yeah, I'll, I'll, this is not what I'm actually using in production, but it's, it's something I'm, I'm playing with to make this, uh, optimize this perhaps. So <coughs> now this, this is, again, this is something you can actually, everyone here can just install and use or, or set up something that suits their particular use case. Something that came up during the uh, developer meeting yesterday is to perhaps, you know, write a prepackaged solution here that you know, it's more easy to deploy and you don't have to write any code yourself. So that might be a future direction here to just write a different logging hook that logs straight back into the same instance, you know, avoiding loops and stuff like that, of course. And then, so for small instances, you can perhaps just, you know, load that and use it without having to do any extra work. That might be something to, to try. Yeah, you better filter by app name. Well, the, the advantage of doing loading it in local sh preload libraries is that you can actually set that per database or user also, so that might also be useful. But of course, one of the advantages of, of not having in the same instance or not even having on the same host is that you can also aggregate, uh, aggregate data from multiple machines. So you have, you have multiple machines logging into the same table or you know, partition set of tables. And, they can compare things that way, so that is also definitely an advantage of, of this over you know, some of the other solutions that just look at a, a single log file. So now that said, um, you know, th this essentially solves my use case of you know, what happened in the last five minutes. If you want to think a little bit long term, perhaps you and you want to basically keep all the logs and do you know big data analysis later, you can also you know for example uh, throw this stuff into Hadoop. And uh, I have some things to show how how to do that. So getting back to this uh, awesome picture I made here. So in the setup I'm using, I'm still using PG log forward as the hook, so I'm not writing my own hook, but instead of the agent, I'm using something called Apache Flume. So, uh, that's an Apache project, which is at flumeapache.org and has a nice picture on the homepage, which looks you know, somewhat familiar to what we want to do. And uh, so, Flume describes itself a distributed, reliable, available service for efficiently collecting, aggregating, and moving large amounts of log data. So it seems to be purpose-built for this sort of thing. Being an Apache project, their main sort of primary use case is having web server log data put into a big data store. But it doesn't have to be web server on this side, and you know, it doesn't also have to be HEFS on this side. But it's kind of geared toward putting things in as a front end to HDFS, essentially. But the, the things on, the, on this side can be pretty much anything. And they support even tailing a log file and throwing it in here or getting syslog data or you know, all kinds of other things. Or you can write your own, which is uh, what I did. So all this is in Java, so you, do, you just download the jar file and uh, unpack it, and then you can be ready to go. The, uh, so if you the sort of dig deep into this space of moving structured data from one end to some other structured storage, 
There's about you know eight different formats you'll encounter in, in five different programming languages, and you have to somehow pick a combination that is the least headache and loses the least amount of data on the way. And I'm, I'm sure there's other permutations of, of getting that data. So one of the most straightforward ways to do this would be to take data in syslog format, which Flume supports out of the box, and throw the syslog data into Flume over UDP or TCP, if you want, and then throw this into HDFS unstructured, and then maybe use pig or, or hive to, to get it out. And that, that would work, but it's not really what I set out to do. So I wrote a few pieces of code of my own, which, so I wrote a sync that takes that JSON UDP format, unpacks it into Flume's native internal transport format. And then on the other hand, take, on the other side, takes that structured format and throws it into HBase as, as separate columns, essentially. So the way you, Configure Flume, you know, is, is, it has, a, has a sources and sinks. So here's, a, there's a bunch of sources you can use. I just threw a few in as an example. Here's a source that I wrote, which is, you know, it's not published at the moment, but I, I plan to do that. It's just have to go through some, uh, you know, internal clearances. Uh, but it, this is not the rocket science code. Right? Uh, so I'm ha running this code on this port here, which should look familiar from the previous examples. That's where PG Log Forward publishes. Flume has also additional features. Uh, here is, an, is a thing called an interceptor, which sort of mangles the data. And one interceptor you can use, for example, is to throw a timestamp into the uh, existing data, because PG Log Forward doesn't actually provide a timestamp, which is kind of weird. And uh, as, uh, on the sync side, here's an example for a sync using the built-in HDFS support, which just throws the data in an unstructured way into HDFS files. And if you don't know what to do with it, there's actually a talk in the, in the, in the next slot. That would, be, that would be one file per log line, yeah? No, it, actually, it's, it sort of rotates file as it wants. So it, it, it just throws stuff into files, and then after, there's additional parameters here. You can tweak this to death of what files it creates and what they're named, and, and, then, and then you would use something like Hive, which just sort of transparently wraps over that, and you can mangle that data however you want. So that's one example. And the other, what I've sort of been concentrating on is using HBase. This is um, the HBase sync is shipped with Flume, but it doesn't actually know how to unpack the stuff I'm sending in, so I wrote a, a separate serializer. So there's a bunch of Java classes in, in the, this pipe, and you have to you know how to wire them together correctly. So, so just to show that as well. Let's see if HBase works today. Just create a table, one column family. Very exciting. Very slow. <laughs> well, this is actually running locally on slash tab, so it shouldn't be that slow. But <laughs> All right. Now, maybe I didn't actually start it. Let's start it first. Yeah. This is also bizarre that if, if you don't start HBase, you can still you know, start the shell, which is like the PSQL equivalent, but you can't do anything, so, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, very interesting. All right, so this was actually 2.4 seconds to create a table in HBase, awesome. So, uh, so this Flume has uh, not many options, actually quite usable. Flume, you start an agent to do some class path stuff to get your custom jar stuff in there. You have to give it a config file, which is the one I just showed you. Then you have to tell it which agent to use, and let's see if that works. OK. 
Okay. So this is debugging output from my code, so you can see it's already doing something. And with any kind of luck, we'll have something over here. Okay, there's all your data. And you can do stuff with HBase then. So if, if you want to play with HBase but you don't have any data to put in it, this is a way to generate lots of data. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's uh, basically why I am at, as I mentioned, I'm the first half of the talk, is putting log data into Postgres is what I'm using. This is you know, something I'm looking into actively now, the, the HBase stuff. Something that I originally wanted to do but have not found a good solution for yet is to actually do some the, the actual rate monitoring using this. So in the, in the beginning I mentioned I'm looking at metrics like number of errors per second or number of transactions per second and, and that stuff is being computed by a separate kind of legacy monitoring system. And ideally, this, you know, if you have this kind of data, you can throw it into some system that can do the counting for you, but I haven't really found a good one to do that yet. So a couple of things I looked at was a, a thing called Rocksteady, which I have a link for, which also comes with a nice picture, but has, you know, lots of moving parts, so if you can't read all the small print. So this is your stuff, this is RabbitMQ, this is Rocksteady, this is Graphite, this is Nagios, this is a dashboard. So there's way too many moving parts here that I have to, you know, I have to monitor the, the monitoring here essentially. So that is a bit uh, dubious for me at the moment, but maybe, you know, with a lot of effort, you can probably make this work. Uh, another thing that I'm actively looking at is this thing called uh, Riemann like the mathematician, so Riemann.io. That would actually do exactly what I need. I just, it's just kind of haven't managed to set it up yet, but maybe that's gonna, you know, something to look at in the next couple months. And of course, Graphite you can also use, and I'm also looking into throwing logging data into Graphite, just, you know, to graph it, but the, actually the, the rate monitoring of graphite, I haven't found that too reliable. You know, it gives you some useful numbers, but if you want to tie that directly to the monitoring, it's not exact enough, so uh, I'm not really using that at the moment. Uh, so that said, there are a, a growing number of commercial you know, platform or software as a service type solutions out there that you know, overlap a lot with all, all of these problems, such as New Relic or Splunk, so we probably heard of one or the other. So, you know, Splunk is, you throw all your syslog data into Splunk and it sort of does a full text indexing on that and you can do analysis based on that. But that, that doesn't have any knowledge of the structure of the Postgres log, so that is not, you know, exactly what we want. And, you know, New, Re New Relic is also something we're using, but it, it, do it doesn't have any knowledge of Postgres either. It's, it's sort of getting there, but it's not there yet, so. But perhaps in you know, a few years when we look back, uh, we don't have to do this anymore, but well, we don't know yet. Of course, all of these solutions cost a, a huge amount of money, so if you don't want to spend that money, then this, these are the, you know, the toolkits for you. So, to uh, conclude. So, look into the logging hooks and look into PG Log Forward. I, I, I you know, think you, you can probably use that. And if, if, you're, if you have been wanting for additional features in the PG stat statements, maybe you don't need to wait for that. Maybe you can you know, build, roll your own analysis based on that. So here are um, a couple links. So in theory, in theory, I have all this material in the GitHub repository, which in theory should be linked from the PGCon website. It wasn't as of a couple hours ago, but I think they're syncing the pentabarf once in a while, so eventually it'll show up there. Or you can, you know, you'll find it through me if you, if you don't find it otherwise. So I have the link to all the tools you know. You know here's the logging hook commit, which essentially serves as the documentation if you want to look that up. The uh, PGLog forward tool I showed, 
the thing I started writing in Go, if you want to experiment with that, the link to Flume. Another thing, actually, I forgot we're looking into is throwing the log data into uh, RabbitMQ. So I mentioned I tried to write a, a logging hook that publishes straight into um, MQP, but I sort of abandoned that because of the blocking issue. But there is a, a UDP plugin for RabbitMQ, which, you know, do a, a small amount of tweaking, you could actually just throw the UDP data that PG log forward publishes into that, and then you have it in the queue, and then you can don't have to write your own agents and stuff, you just write consumers that use that data. I, I am told by our resident RabbitMQ expert that there are some architectural problems with that UDP exchange as it's implemented. You know, given time, which is scarce, that can be fixed. So, but I, that's certainly very interesting. And, and linked to Rocksteady. So, that is what I have. Any questions? Josh. So, now PG log forward doesn't have any way to filter inside. It does have. Uh, it does have a very rudimentary ways of filter. So the question that's for the audio here is. Uh, Josh asked if the PG log folder doesn't have any way of filtering. It, it does have very simple ways of filtering. One I showed by the, the log level. The other is it has a way to filter by a, just a text string it looks for. So you can do a small amount of filtering with that. Uh, if you want to go beyond that, of course, you can you know, change the source code. The question in that then becomes how much load do you want to put into that component versus all the downstream components. I don't think there's a universal answer for that. As I mentioned, Skype was sort of building this as a way of offloading load from the server, so they're probably not going to be very interested in that. That, that said, I should mention, Martin does take patches to PG log forward, so I've sent him a few fixes and mini features, so that is certainly in active development. You know, there are certain, Probably ways you can add a little bit more filtering, but if it's too complex, you probably want to put that somewhere downstream. S Susanna. The license of PG Log Forward. Probably as many things on GitHub doesn't have a license. Oh, actually, it has a license. Oh, yeah, that's the license. Oh. Well, you can't see the letters, but you can guess from the shape what license it is. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, fine, it's fine to use, so. You can basically have triggers when it gets to the roads that if you need to log this, put it in the database, whatever, right? Yeah, okay, so you, 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 you you're saying you want to use triggers on the logging database to, like, inform about events. Yeah, okay, so to repeat that, so you're saying you want to put triggers on the logging table to f look for, ba based on text or other things, yeah, to look for events yeah, and put them in other places, yes. Okay, yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, the possibilities here are endless, and part of the, the reason why I want to you know, show this here is, is to just get more people involved in this, uh, these sort of ideas to see what kind of a common ground would be. Um, one caveat there is... Of course, if you produce a lot of logging data, you can also overload your logging database, right? So I would, you know, be a little bit hesitant to put lots of extra triggers and stuff on, on the receiving end, and perhaps have more asynchronous pro processing for that. But that you have to, you have to find that out for yourself. But that's certainly a possibility. Yeah. Jan. Yeah, but that's not different from like how the, the stats collector works. So at some point, you ha at some point, you either have to wait or you have to lose the data. Or you know, you have to. That's the trade-off you have to make for itself. 
I, I have, you know, what I'm using, I spent a fair amount of tuning it for our workload and network and all that stuff, so it seems to work well. Uh, you know, I would like to do, you know, throw more data in there, but I have, you know, found a sweet spot that works. And, uh, you know, we, all, yeah, so. Yeah, we do, yeah, partitioning and, you know, indexes, and, yeah, of course, the basic stuff, right? So. Uh, do, you, do you have like a, a business card or anything? No. What's a business card? Is that? <laughs> okay. My my business card is is this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Feel free to come up afterwards if you want to stay in contact. And you know, I'm. Okay, people who know me know where to find me. If you don't know where to find me, send, please feel, send me an email or, or tweet me or. I would certainly like to chat with more people about what they, you know, if they have interest in this, this space to, to develop more common solutions. Nope. Okay. There is, uh, if you're interested in Hadoop, there's a Hadoop session in the next, uh, next slot, so otherwise, uh, thanks.